Welcome to the Portland Interior Designer Spotlight Series, featuring in-depth interviews with some of Portland's most influential and innovative interior designers. These public conversations, sponsored by Sealoom and PortlandArchitecture.com, are a nexus for Portland's vibrant design community, an opportunity for casual networking, and the perfect place to hear about the next big thing in Portland design. Now, please join us at Sealoom's beautiful ceiling showroom in the heart of Portland's Eastside Industrial District for Portland Interior Designer Spotlight. The Oregonian newspaper dubbed him Stager to the Stars. Justin Reardon is the founder of Spade & Archer Design Agency. As the creative energy behind Spade & Archer, Reardon fuses his formal training as an architect with his natural design savvy to create beautiful and authentic spaces for clients. Prior to opening Spade and Archer in 2009, Reardon practiced interior architecture and interior construction for 12 years, including a tenure at Gensler, the world's largest architecture firm, affording him an esteemed skill set and diverse background for home staging. With more than a decade of hands-on project management and design experience, Reardon delivers an unmatched level of precision, expertise, and service to his clients. Since founding Spade and Archer, he has personally prepared over 2,100 homes for uh, market. Joining Justin in conversation will be noted architecture and design writer and founder of PortlandArchitecture.com, Brian Libby. Brian's byline frequently appears in the New York Times, Dwell, Metropolis, Architect Magazine, Contract Design and Eco Structure, and his blog, Portland Architecture, is the city's most prominent resource for news and in-depth coverage of projects and issues encompassing the regional design community. And we are very happy to host this event in Sealoom's Portland showroom, the only manufacturer-owned ceiling showroom in North America, which we've opened here as a resource for the interior design industry. If you have any questions about our unique ceiling tiles or panels, uh, please ask me or Ben. We're, uh, we're happy to help you guys out with uh, any info. And uh, without further delay, please allow me to introduce Justin Reardon and Brian Libby. Thank you. I wanted to uh, uh, maybe uh, begin by uh, asking you to tell us a little bit about your background as a designer and that uh, you know, I know you studied architecture and uh, I also wondered maybe before that, like, um, you know, this is something we end up asking a lot of the designers here, like, um, you know, some people kind of have a, a sense early on of what they want to do, like, you know, um, and some people have a more roundabout path to it. And so I wondered, you know, like, uh, if you knew that you wanted to be involved in some kind of design profession, be it architecture or interiors or otherwise, you know, from an early age or, or you know, how you got to how you got to architecture school and so forth. Absolutely. Um, I'd love to say thank you so much for, for having us. Thank you all so much for coming today. And thank you to Selim for hosting us. I really appreciate it. Um, so growing up, um, I think the first memory I ever had of a job that I actually wanted to do, um, I wanted to be a solid gold dancer, <laughs> um, which would have been super awesome, but unfortunately it went off the air before uh -huh. I had a chance to uh -huh. try out. Um, and um, so I ended up going to school for architecture at the University of Hawaii, um, uh -huh. and I was at the University of Idaho for two years. I didn't like it there. Uh -huh. um, it was too cold and too small. And so um, I told my parents, I said, I want to transfer to another school. And they said, well, then pay for it yourself. <laughs> and so um, I was a cheerleader at the time, which was working on my solid gold dancer roots. Yeah, you bet. Um, and um, I decided to look for schools that would offer both scholarships in cheerleading and have architecture programs because I wasn't mm -hmm. smart enough to get an academic scholarship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I found um, Tennessee Knoxville and University of Hawaii were the two <laughs> schools that had both of those things. And I was like, Tennessee or Hawaii? Yeah, and tough like, call. Oh, tough call, yeah. So I went with Hawaii. Uh -huh. um, went to school in Hawaii, um, uh, did cheerleading, learned a ton about teamwork um, mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. being a cheerleader. Mm -hmm. Learned a little bit about architecture mm -hmm. from going to architecture school. Like the architecture of pyramids, maybe. Yeah, we a lot you of pyramids, know. yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and uh, graduated from there, um, moved to San Francisco. I had a couple of like, I've always been kind of a goal setter. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so I set some really basic goals for San Francisco. I wanted to um, get married, start a career, have a kid and buy a house. Yeah, so and nothing special. Nothing, just like little little <laughs> minor things. And I wanted to finish that by the time I was 35. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, I, when I hit 30, I had all of those done. 
and um, I was there uh, with my husband and my son, mm -hmm. and we um, realized that San Francisco wasn't sustainable for us anymore. And mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. we moved um, up to Portland, and um, we were here for a couple of years before we started the company. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's is that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, how much do you feel like your your design training uh, helps you in your business, or or um, you know maybe that could be the next thing we could talk about is is how you started to make your way through some of the different professions you did um, when when you and I met earlier, it seemed like uh, these sort of different stages of your career before your true career, um, you know, uh, helped you in different ways, getting sort of a design sense from uh, studying architecture and also, um, uh, you know, working in the construction field and some of those other things you've done. So my entire background before home staging was in um, commercial tenant improvements and high rise buildings. Uh -huh. um, and so um, in the beginning, I was kind of a CAD monkey. I drew details and I designed so many bathrooms in so many, like endless amounts of bathrooms. I can still tell you like uh -huh. all of the ADA codes for every single commercial bathroom out there <laughs> um, and that was my start of it and I realized that in the architecture world I was like a 50th percentile designer I was mediocre mm -hmm. um, in the real world I'm like 99th percentile but when you get to Gensler everybody's 99th percentile and mm -hmm. so within that 99th percent I was like you know halfway I was I was okay at it mm -hmm. um, but it was a really really good project manager mm -hmm. um, I was able to get us money and get us paid and stay on budget and get it done on time the way nobody else in architecture could because architects are notoriously horrible business people yeah <laughs> um, we're really bad at it and um, so um, because I was good at that side I kept seeing my counterparts on the construction side um, that were the project managers and they were getting huge accolades and they were the top of the food chain and they were being treated so well. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, when I adopted my son, um, I stayed, I made an agreement with my employer that I would stay home for a few months to take care of my son and uh -huh. the, the employer um, let me go on Martin Luther King Day, which my son is black, <laughs> and he let me go on Martin Luther King Day, which I was like, you do see the irony here, right? <laughs> um, and so I was like, curse you, um, but it ended up being a really great thing because I jumped from there into construction. Mm -hmm. I called the construction company that I've been working with for a while and I mm -hmm. said, um, I would love to come in and just be like an assistant. I will like get you coffee. And they're mm -hmm. like, well, how about if you're a project manager for us? Oh, and we'll double your salary. Oh, and we'll buy you a car. <laughs> and I was like, ah, uh, let me think about it. And they're like, why would you think about uh -huh. it? And I was like, okay, uh -huh. I'll do it. Uh -huh. um, and so um, I was managed to make that leap over to construction. Uh -huh. On the construction side of things was really interesting because um, Design is very gray, mm -hmm. um, and when you're when you're doing design, you you think you know you're doing it correctly, and then somebody comes up to you and they're like, "You did it wrong," mm -hmm. and you're like, "No, I really did it right. I swear." <laughs> and there's a ton of like gray explanation. Mm -hmm. In construction, you're given a set of drawings, and you build it to the set of drawings, and it's black or white. Either mm -hmm. you did it right or you didn't, and right. there's no question of that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I loved construction for that. Either mm -hmm. you did it correctly or, and you didn't, and, and it was just like so cut and dry and so perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the economy crashed. Um, I was working construction up here doing project management and there was no chance I was going to get a job as a contractor or as a um, as a architect. And so I said, okay, well, what would you do then? And I was like, oh, I really like lamps, so I will open a lamp store. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I realized that I have zero experience in retail. I've never worked retail in my entire <laughs> life. Um, and so the lamp store wasn't going to work. Right. And so I said, okay, if you didn't have to get paid and you could do any service industry at all, mm -hmm. what would you do? And I said, I would move around people's furniture. And um, I said, okay, now, how do you get paid for that? And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, home staging. So I called my husband. He was in New York at the time visiting his family. And I said, Joe, we're gonna open a home staging company. We're gonna call it Spade and Archer. And he goes, that sounds great. And I was like, best husband ever. <laughs> um, and so like within a week, I think we had a website and a business license. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, it's ever since then, we've been going strong. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you really, you, 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 it seems like you really found your, your calling and that you, you knew that you could sort of marry your project management skills with a certain design acumen that you had as well. And uh, you know, I, I found it interesting uh, to, to read about what you do and like, for example, the uh, interview you did with the Oregonian and, and uh, you had done some other writing for them as well. And like, uh, you talked about some kind of simple concepts that maybe people sometimes uh, who aren't in the profession or who aren't designers uh, might forget that, that they're kind of rules that exist for a reason. Yeah. Like you talked about symmetry and repetition and rhythm and, and, and some of those simple principles 
principles that uh, kind of transcend all the different projects or or the different styles or the different you know set of conditions. Yeah. The School um, of Architecture in at University of Idaho is associated under the School of Art. Oh. And so when you major in architecture there, you take a lot of art classes, and they drill into those basics of design. And it's rhythm, repetition, um, scale, color, and texture. Mm -hmm. Those five things that you do over and over and over and over and over again. And so when I made that leap into um, into home staging, mm -hmm. I was like, these are the five principles that are missing from this industry. This is what doesn't get done. And so we took those very, very basic elements and we um, drilled them into our rooms over and over and over. And when you think of something like rhythm or repetition, um, human beings find things beautiful that repeat themselves. Like we love flowers because when you look at a flower bush, it's the same thing over and over and mm -hmm, over mm -hmm. again. Like and fractal so, imagery. Yeah, we love that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what drives us nuts as human beings. We find it beautiful. And so mm -hmm. if we can recreate that in interior spaces, we walk in and without even knowing why we like it, we just do. Mm -hmm. And it's because it reacts in our like in our gut it says this is this is how it's supposed to be this is right versus having just a bunch of mismatched peaches that are just thrown into a right. room and they're like that and this makes no sense to me right yeah it seems like a, a, a people sometimes even come to you and kind of want you to do a sort of staging that becomes an interior design for almost like their whole house and, and it, I feel like it kind of speaks to these rules and also that there's a sense of kind of uh, uh, restraint that goes into this and, and, and even though the projects I see that, that you've done are full of, of color and texture and pattern and, and some of these general rules that we've talked about, you know, they're, they're, um, I, I, I think uh, it speaks to a kind of talent of, of being able to say no and, and to kind of um, to be able to edit yourself and, and some of those uh, uh, principles as well. Yeah, the rooms are are very restrained. <coughs> we use color um, in a very simple way. Um, our larger items, um, couches, chairs, rugs, tables, those things are all neutrals, and so mm -hmm. black, white, cream, gray, brown, beige. Um, it's the non-rainbow colors. Um, those are our neutrals. And then we'll come back through with another layer of color on top of that. And that mm -hmm. color will be one color story. It might be like, this is a raspberry room. Little nod out to Prince on the raspberry beret. <laughs> um, and then, um, or this is, a, this is a peacock room. Mm -hmm. And what we, the reason we do that one color per room is because one, when they're photographed, they're tiny on, mm -hmm. the, on a website when you see them. And so when you have more than one color, they become very um, distracting. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you walk through a house, one of our houses, houses and um, you go home after seeing 10 houses that day and each room ha each house had 10 rooms um, if you say to your husband and your wife you say do you remember the house that had the wood floors and it had the windows in the living room with the fireplace and they're mm -hmm. like uh, I don't really remember that one uh -huh. but if you say do you remember the house that had the pink bedroom I'm like yes I remember that house well mm -hmm. I think the green room should be Jill's bedroom and so we give them um, a label or a moniker to place on each room in the house so they can easily discuss our house. Mm -hmm. We know for a fact that no couple is going to buy a house that they can't agree on. And if they can't even discuss it, they certainly can't agree on it. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's very formulaic. It's to make it so that our clients have an easy time not only digesting but also discussing our projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And you, I believe you've also even uh, uh, taught a seminar to real estate people, um, kind of like a, 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 on buyer psychology. And I, I find that uh, aspect of it interesting. And it's it's why certain types of interior design I find really interesting also, because there's some kind of knowledge about the behavioral patterns of, of people and some of their psychological instincts. So you know, it seems like that's an, an aspect of the design process uh, you've explored as well, as a, as a way of kind of you know making sure you're getting you know pe clients what they want. Right. Baseline in home staging is pretty mm -hmm. like if you make it pretty like you hit like the base and there's believe me there's a lot of, of staging that doesn't hit the base um, and so if you can elevate that slightly higher and say not only we're we making it pretty we're understanding what people are gonna go through as they walk through this house mm -hmm. um, average person is in a home for seven to nine minutes um, we spend more time trying on a pair of jeans than we do deciding if we're going to move forward with purchasing a house or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fast. And mm -hmm. in the larger cities in America, it's even faster at this point because you're putting in offers like immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to get somebody to understand a house in mm -hmm. seven to nine minutes, if they're walking in and they're like, oh gosh, I'm not sure if my king size bed can fit in this bedroom and where, what wall would I put it on and where would my TV go and how do I place my couch in this room? where they would spend two or three minutes trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. If the house is staged, the furniture will tell them that instantly. They walk in and they go, that's where my couch goes because it's already there. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we can answer those questions, um, we're making it a lot easier for them. And so 
getting our real estate clientele to understand that um, that it's not just about pretty pillows and which piece of furniture do you choose. It's mm -hmm. actually about the placement of those items and, and the education and um, ability of the stager that's actually putting those in those houses that's going to make sure that they understand the house itself as they walk mm -hmm. through without mm -hmm. overshadowing the house. I always say that we're backup dancers. The house is Tina Turner, we're the backup dancers. Yeah, so you kind of became a solid gold dancer Yeah, after all. we, we yeah. are a solid gold dancer, yes. <laughs> So um, you have to, I think in ho good home staging, you have to be good. To be, a, to be a backup dancer, you have to be a good dancer. Yeah. But you can't be better than Tina. You can't do that. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. so- It's um, a talent of, on, on its, of yes, its own. It's like 20 feet from fame. We yeah. have to walk in yeah. and people walk in and they look at our houses and like, well, this house is really beautiful, but they should pay attention to the house. If they're mm -hmm. paying attention to the you know, fantastic piece of furniture that's in there, mm -hmm. we failed because we're overshadowing the star and that's not what we should be doing. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah. I also wanted to ask you uh, a little bit about just kind of what it takes to, to make a, a company like this happen from a kind of logistical standpoint. Like, uh, I understand if I'm not mistaken, like you, you kind of buy a lot of furniture and have a kind of warehouse of furniture that you, you use to kind of draw from. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what it takes to kind of get the job done and to, to be there. And yeah, do it. I think the first ingredient is balls of steel. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you, <laughs> that sounds really, um, it, it's horrifying sometimes, I gotta tell you. Um, I mean, at this point, between Seattle and Portland and Palm Springs, we have 65 houses staged. Um, we're doing eight load-ins per, I'm sorry, 12 load-ins per week and 12 um, D stages per week. Wow. So, I mean, there's furniture is just moving fast. Um, I think the hardest part of this job is finding the right people. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm horrible at, at interviewing people. I'm horrible at hiring people because I'm um, extremely flirtatious. So forgive me, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, and Quite so right. when, so <laughs> when somebody walks into a space, I fall in love with them and I want them to be my best friend. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and, and I, I tend to find that I hire people that I like, mm -hmm. which people that I like aren't necessarily good at home staging. <laughs> and so we develop a system um, where we it's kind of like an episode of Double Dare. Um, mm -hmm. We do physical challenges where we like make them draw floor plans. We make them actually stage a room. Mm -hmm. We make them pick out the furniture that goes into it. Um, we, we really test not only their skill set, but we also time it. So we test how they deal with stress because I got to tell you, We'll stage a 6,000 square foot house in 10 hours. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's fast. There's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure there. And you know, don't mess it up because you mm -hmm. will get a phone call the next day that's like, we don't like this house. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, I think that um, making this business go is all about having the right people. And since we started doing these physical challenges and interviewing people through that process, we've really found the right people. We <coughs> don't hire any um, design managers that don't have a degree, like a formal education in design. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, all of our um, warehouse people all have backgrounds in carpentry, so they know how to fix and deal with houses. Right. Um, and so having those right people there make it so that I can actually do my job. And my job at this point really is procurement and then PR. Mm -hmm. So I go and I do things like this and talk to people and thank you guys again for being here. <laughs> um, and then I buy a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and picking out the right furniture that goes into a house I think is huge. Um, so we're constantly looking for items that are classic, that are not gonna go out of style in five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying not to buy things that are trendy. We could care less if it's comfortable or not. People are always like, well, did you sit in this couch? I've never sat in one of my couches, honestly. <laughs> um, I walk into the store, I pick them up to see if they're heavy or not. I make sure that the legs come off so that we can get them through doors. Mm -hmm. um, and do they look right? And those are my criteria, that's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, I, if it meets that criteria, then great. But mm -hmm. if it's comfortable, I honestly don't care. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think those are kind of the big, the big things. Yeah, yeah. I also, when I was reading the uh, the Oregonian story, uh, they have uh, all the designers in the series uh, answer kind of like a thing called five things they know about design. And uh, uh, it, it, when I read those five things, it, it, it brought about a larger point I thought about you and that um, there's this interesting combination of a really strong design acumen and understanding of what the problem is and how to how to achieve you know a good a good solution for your clients and there's also a sense that um, that um, you you see the value in kind of the business side of it of, of having good customer service and like your first 
uh, thing that you listed was uh, good design cannot exist in the absence of good service. And you know, um, because design is kind of like an artistic and creative profession, you know, there there can always be you know some people in, in architecture, interior design, or other design disciplines that can be you know a little bit on the kind of artiste or prima donna side. And and it seems like you've found a way to to really be creative, but it but remain um, sort of strategic and pragmatic about um, running a business too. Yeah. I think it's very easy in design to get a big head mm -hmm. and to think of ourselves as being self-important because you are constantly defending your work and um, you put your product out there and a lot of times people don't like it. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you're constantly trying to boost yourself up and make yourself feel good about your work, what you, what you did, like, I am good at this. Mm -hmm. I, officially, I'm good at this. I know mm -hmm. this. At the same time, you can go too far with that. You can get overblown. And really, when it comes down to it, there's like a hierarchy of design. There's like, you know, um, architects are up here, and then there's like interior designers, and then like down here is like home stagers. Mm -hmm. um, and for a home stager to get a big head to say things like, you know, I'm the only person who can make aesthetic decisions here, um, that's not going to make for a happy client. Mm -hmm. And if a client calls you up and they're like, gosh, we really love the house, but this piece of art that's over the fireplace, we just, we hate it. Right. And so we're like, okay, great, no problem. We'll swap that out for you in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. No problem. Mm -hmm. We don't care. Um, and we're first and foremost a design, we're first and foremost a, a service company, and we're right. secondary a design company. Um, and we can't, we literally won't exist unless we do it. We're very, very fortunate that we work with fantastic clients. Um, our real estate agents are unbelievably kind and generous, not only in the compliments that they give us, but also the negative feedback. Mm -hmm. And when we get negative feedback from our clients, when they call us something like, hey, you know what, this went really well for us, but this didn't go well for mm -hmm. us. We keep a spreadsheet that we call the Mrs. Spreadsheet, and it's not Mrs. as in like Mr. and Mrs., it's Mrs. like a swing and a miss. Right. Um, and when we screw things up, we chart it, and we write down like, okay, we had this problem where this thing happened, and then we put an X next to it. And every time we get something that has more than five Xs next to it, that's a repetitive problem that we have not produced a system to deal with that. Right. That is our problem, not just a fluke. If something happens once, you have a miss, and like, oh man, that sucked, mm -hmm. that's not, a process problem. Mm -hmm. But if it keeps happening over and over again, we forget dust ruffles like five days in a row, there's a problem. We need a checklist mm -hmm. back there that shows mm -hmm. us that we need to pull dust ruffles. Are that, they're not called dust ruffles anymore, they're called bed skirts. Sorry, I'm old <laughs> school. Yeah. Um, uh, you're working now in, in, it, uh, in three different cities, in Seattle and Palm Springs and Portland, and uh, I wanted to ask you just if, if there are kind of differences that come from being in different cities, or, or also um, maybe as a side note, if, if uh, in any of those three cities, if there are any kind of memorable um, uh, you know, assignments or projects that have come to mind. I know. So two parts of that question, we'll talk about the differences between the cities first. Mm. So Palm Springs is a totally different market for us. Um, we do almost exclusively vacation rental setups. Mm -hmm. So if somebody buys a house, the house is empty, they call us up, they're like, can you please furnish this house? And we'll mm -hmm. come in in two days, blam the whole thing out, and they can rent it on the third day. Mm -hmm. um, so totally different market down there, and I literally fly down to just meet with clients down there, and that's it. We don't even have a home base there at all. So we're serving it because there's a, there's a need for us down there. Uh -huh. um, Seattle and Portland, very, very similar markets, slightly different from each other. Um, Portland people are extremely polite, extremely nice. Um, and Seattle people are also nice, but also really honest. And so they'll tell you, I, I, people say Seattle is so passive aggressive. I'm like, totally, but Portland is aggressively passive aggressive. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, when somebody in Portland's not happy with mm -hmm. you, they don't tell you. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're like, well, like, well, I was gonna meet with you, but my mom died, sorry, I gotta go. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you never really find out when you mm -hmm. mess up. And um, so um, <laughs> those two markets are slightly different from each mm -hmm. other in that way. And I, I, don't get me wrong, I love Portland. I, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm aggressively passive aggressive as well. Mm -hmm. Work-wise, so memorable projects, um, you know, the, the ones that you remember are the ones that trusted you when you didn't have anything to go off of. Mm -hmm. um, and so probably that one of our very, very first projects in Portland was, um, was it the number five firehouse on 23rd? So it's this firehouse. Mm -hmm. It was um, in the, when the economy was in the tank and it was a $1.2 million two bedroom apartment mm -hmm. above a giant garage because it was an old firehouse. Right. And um, the client called me up and said, can you please come look at it? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And I don't even know if we had like inventory at that point. I think we literally went out and bought furniture to put into this house. Mm -hmm. And it was so gigantic to me because somebody trusted me to do this job 
even though they didn't really know I was going to do a good job, which yeah. was and it was just everything to me. And then you know we've been open in Seattle since January fourth, and um, a client approached us maybe in like our second week, and she said, I saw your website, and we want you to come in and do our model home. Mm. And so there's a ton of new condo buildings that are being built in Seattle, and all of a sudden, in like the last three weeks, we're getting show like model apartment after model apartment after model. We've all of a sudden become like the model apartment stager in, mm -hmm. in, in Seattle, and it's because of this one client trusted us, and she knows Everybody and she, they are talking about us over and over and over again. We don't pay for advertising; it gets like against my moral core. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything we do is word of mouth. And so when you find somebody like that that is willing to spread that word about you, it's it's an amazing thing, and you just you're so thankful. Mm -hmm. um, and so right now, it's not necessarily about like that individual prize. It's finding that person that's willing to talk about you and willing to say mm -hmm. that you did a good job for them. And you know, I, at this point, when any anybody does a good job for me, I I try all the time to tell that story. Like, mm -hmm. this is somebody who did a good job for me, and you should work with them, and they're fantastic. And so, mm -hmm. that word of mouth thing, I think that's what I love most about the Pacific Northwest is that mm -hmm. it really works here. You can yeah. really do it here. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Um, given what you do, and 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 you know the the constraints that come, and the, and the challenges of timing and everything, I wondered if you ever felt tempted to to go uh, your own route, like with your own house, or if you if you had like a, a dream house, I wondered if it would be like very different from the kind of work you do every day, or like a, 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 if either, if you've had the chance to think, think of either one. Yeah, um, so dream house, I live in my dream house. Mm. Um, we bought the house, it's an 1893 Queen Anne Victorian, mm. um, and it was went through a really bad flip in 2007, um, mm. and, and it, like it's still reeling in pain from it. They put like a Pearl District kitchen into this like Queen Anne Victorian, it's hysterical. Mm -hmm. um, and we bought it with the intention of it being a 25 year house. Mm -hmm. um, and our intention was that my son, Dooley, would um, start kindergarten in that house and would go through his entire schooling career throughout college uh -huh. and always come back to that same house. And that's that's our goal with that house. Oh, super. Um, I moved every year and a half when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. My parents were the government and for the Forest Service, and so we moved all the time. And so I wanted Dooley to have that um, experience of being able to be settled and grounded in a place. Um, my husband and I are gay, obviously. Mm. My son is black. We moved to the corner of Rosa Parks and, and uh, Martin Luther King because uh -huh. we were like, that's the one neighborhood in Oregon where like we can both be comfortable. <laughs> um, and so um, it's been great. My son goes to school. He has 10% black kids in his school with him, mm -hmm. which is unheard of in Oregon. Yeah. Um, he'll go to a high school that is, I think, 50% black at this point, Jefferson, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and so our house, um, it, it is kind of our dream house. It's funny because the, the, I hired an architect to do a renovation. He's actually here today. So Brian, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, he's working on plans for us to do a renovation on that house. And oh, really great. all that we're doing is we are undoing the flip. Mm -hmm. We're making that house be what it should have been what should have happened to it the first time. So we're basically un-home depoting it. <laughs> um, so um, if we, you know, and, and um, we're not looking for it to look like it did in like in 1890 when it was built. Mm -hmm. We're looking for it to look like it wasn't messed up. Right. So yeah. Right. That's really the big thing. That should be like the name of a of a TV show, like Und Home Depot. Your home. I don't know if they'd go for that, honestly. <laughs> not sponsored by Home Depot. Right. You know? Sponsored by Lowe's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in a second, we'll turn it over to the uh, audience. But I guess just a final question I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, just kind of if you could share a little bit about what your passions are, maybe culturally or otherwise, you know, like, um, you know, uh, like maybe the best way to ask it is like, what gives you a sense of wonder, whether it's, you know, um, you know, art or going to the mountains or, or just family time or whatever, but what really sort of gets you jazzed uh, when it doesn't have to do with work? <clears throat> um, so I really only do two things in my entire life. It's family and it's work. Uh -huh. um, and my husband's a stay-at-home dad, which enables me to work like 390 hours a week, mm -hmm. um, which is great. And I love that he loves doing that because I tried it for three months and I was awful. <laughs> um, what gives me a sense of wonder? I mean, the things that we are really passionate about at this point, um, I really love understanding people mm -hmm. and the way that people um, react and interact with each other. And um, it's, I, I, I literally, I, on my phone, I have pictures of strangers on my phone because mm -hmm. we'll drive by like a bus stop and I'll see some dude in like, you know, a pointy leather jacket with white, like, 
spandex pants and a huge like rodeo belt buckle and I'm like, oh my god, I need to take a picture of that person. <laughs> is fascinated with people and the way that they lead their lives and the way that they interact with each other. And, mm -hmm. and really, I mean, it comes back, I'm cheating because it's part of work too, because that's how people, I, I love figuring out when somebody writes me an email. Mm -hmm. And you know what, sometimes you can't hear inflection in an email and so you're, you're trying to figure out like, what are they really asking here? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's like a, a huge passion of mine is like figuring out what people, what their intentions really are. Mm -hmm. Not that they're trying to hide them, it's just that sometimes we aren't clear with our mm -hmm. intentions mm -hmm. and how to appropriately react so that we can elicit the right response from them. Mm -hmm. And so um, really, I. I don't believe in the afterlife. I'm not that kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I think that that this is our one chance. There's no pretest. Like this is it. This mm -hmm. is the final exam. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that really um, paying attention to how we interact with each other and how we interact with ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, making this really the best life that you can possibly lead every mm -hmm. single day. That's that's inspiring to me. So like trying mm -hmm. out new restaurants and going and seeing a, a new movie or a new play or um, interacting with my kid or mm -hmm. um, having a sit down conversation with mine and my employees mm -hmm. and, and making their lives better at the same time as making my life better, that's, that's dreamy to me. That's super. And you know, it, it struck me as you were saying that, that when you were special, especially when you were talking about kind of like investigating and studying people, it, it, uh, it brought me back around to the idea that it's almost like a kind of detective work that is done as a designer. And uh, I realized that I never asked you to, you know, tell the story of how the um, spade and archer name came about, uh, yeah. other than it being inspired by uh, the black bird. So I lived at <coughs> excuse me, I lived at 891 Post Street. Mm -hmm. um, it's at the corner of Post and Hyde in San Francisco. And um, I had said to, were, you, were we married at that point? Were you my fiance or my husband at that point? Yeah. Uh, he was my fiance. <laughs> we're both like hairy gay men, so it was our fur um, <laughs> Don't repeat that, it's horrible. Um, so <laughs> my husband. Um, so I should just stop right now. Um, <laughs> So uh, I had said to my husband, I really want to read the classics. I want to read like the classic San Francisco books. And he had gotten me a set of Tales of the City and mm -hmm. he bought me a bunch of Dashiell Hammett novels. Super. And um, so I was reading um, uh, uh, The Maltese Falcon. And in the book, Sam Spade is the main character. Miles Archer is his partner. Right. He dies in like the first paragraph. Yep. It's a very short part. Um, and Sam Spade goes home after like investigating this murder of his partner mm -hmm. and he goes home to my building. He's literally like, <laughs> it's at the corner of Post and Hyde. He describes the entryway, he describes my apartment to a T and I'm reading this book in the apartment that Sam Spade lives in and I'm like, this is crazy. So I go to the landlord and I'm like, landlord, what gives? Why does Sam Spade live here? And he's like, ugh. I'm like, what? He's like, Dashiell Hammett wrote the book when he lived in the corner unit and the guy who lives there now won't let us even like change out the plumbing because he says it's historically significant. And oh, he's driving bet. me crazy. And I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. Mm -hmm. um, and at the point I was, this is almost 20 years ago. And um, uh, I, I said, if I ever owned my own company, I would call it Spade and Archer. And so we changed it from Spade and Archer detective agency to design agency. Mm -hmm. And our logo is literally based off the window of their offices where mm -hmm. they're scraping off Miles yeah, Archer's Yeah, I was gonna name, ask like if you had some through. kind of glass that you could write the name on. Yeah, it's on, our, it's on our warehouse, yeah. So like uh -huh. the, everything comes from that movie. Um, and it, it's worked out really well because people recognize it, but they don't know why. Mm -hmm. They have a they have an instant familiarity, but not enough that they're like, ah, oh, Dashiell Hammett. It's maybe mm -hmm. about one in a hundred people identify it. Well, they can think Humphrey Bogart, perhaps. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, and yeah, we have uh, we have a little bit of history with Humphrey Bogart. So yeah. He was in um, uh, Casablanca. Um, and right, lots that movie and lots of other things, right. so, Big Sleep, and um, he had, Bogart has a Portland history as well. Uh, his first wife was uh, from Portland, and there's like a table at Jake's restaurant that's named for him because he used to always hang out there and stuff. Nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So in that movie, he says to the piano player, play it again, Sam. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy who played Sam, his name was Dooley. His mm -hmm. first name was Dooley, which ah. is my son's name as well. And so That's so great. Um, yeah, we were like, that's a little bit of connections there. So, Super yeah. duper. Well, uh, does anyone from the audience have a question for Justin? So I, honestly, I think the scariest thing about, about home staging is financing. Um, it's, it costs an enormous amount of money to purchase that much furniture. Um, and so my best advice to you, um, things that I wish I had done, is I wish that I had secured a line of credit early on um, 
uh, that was at a good interest rate and then set up a plan to repay that line of credit on a regular basis. Um, I think that you know when you're when we were like three years into it, we were buried under a mountain of debt, right. and it was horrifying. Um, and you know you spend a lot of time crawling your way back out. Um, and so, I would say um, that would be number one. Number two would be um, n there. Are, no matter how you price your work, people will always be disappointed. And there's some people that their nature is just to say, you could say, I'll do it for a penny tomorrow. And they're like, can you do it for a half a penny today? <laughs> and you're like, no, I'm sorry. You, ha you have to be able to say, no, I'm sorry. We can't do it for that price. And the people that want you to slash your prices every single day, those aren't the people you want to work with. Um, because no matter what you do, they're never going to be happy with you. And so set your pricing so that you can make a profit and stick to your guns. That's, you know, it doesn't have to be outrageous, but you should be able to eat dinner. Dinner is fun. It's sustaining. You should be able to eat it. Um, and just because somebody tells you that you're too expensive doesn't mean that you are. It just means that they think you are. So at my house, we have always had a vintage radio in our kitchen, and it's always tuned to NPR. And every morning, it gets turned on, and we listen to NPR on an old radio. It's the kind that like takes like five minutes to actually warm up. Oh, with like vacuum like, tubes. Yeah, it's vacuum tubes in it. And so um, it became our trademark that we always leave a vintage radio. We put our brochures next to it, and um, yeah, it's been like our our calling card. And I think yeah, and, you know, I think there's a Meredith. <laughs> nice. Meredith Bear is a home stager in LA. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. really is a home stager to the stars. I don't know where that came from for me, but okay. Um, so she um, leaves a pig in every house. There's like a ceramic pig in every house. And so I think that you know having your calling card and making yeah. sure people can recognize you, mm -hmm. um, it's gigantic. Because in home staging, you do your work and you walk away. And so there has to be something there that tells a story of, of that you were there. On Instagram, we post pictures of rooms that have furniture and no people in them. So they're incredibly boring. And it sucks to say like, look, here's another bedroom we staged, like over and over and over again. So we started writing staging stories. Uh -huh. And there'll be things like um, a pink bedroom with a set of skis. And it'll say something to the effect of like, you know, um, after the accident, they just couldn't take down her room. <laughs> you know, and it's just like incredibly sad, depressing stories about these really beautiful spaces. And it's literally me so bored that uh -huh. I'm like, I have to write something. We. Uh, you mentioned a little bit, but can you paint, uh, describe kind of a visual picture of a house that you staged or a picture? I'm walking through the door. What am I going to see? What am I going to feel? What do you do to get there? What do you leave out? You know, that sort of, so what's your sort of basic philosophy? What does it look like? Let's talk about what you're not going to see first. So you are not going to see anything that marks territory. Um, so a lot of people will say um, you shouldn't have personal effects. I don't want our houses to look impersonal. They should look warm and personal and inviting. But there shouldn't be anything that marks territory. So um, a territory marker would be like family photographs, um, trophies, um, degrees that have names on them, calendars with appointments on it. Um, what these territory markers do is they instantly change you from being a new homeowner to a welcomed guest. And the last thing you want to be is a welcome guest when you're looking for a house because that means you're thinking about the family that lives there currently. So there are no territory markers at all. Um, you're also not going to see anything that's emotionally evocative. So um, it's really hard to buy art for mm -hmm. home staging because um, art, the artist's job is to evoke emotion. And so we're constantly looking for beautiful artwork that evokes no emotion in anybody, which is really <laughs> hard to find. Um, so it's like a lot of like seashells and horses. Um, so, um, and you have to find it, and it shouldn't be cheesy. So you're not going to find artwork of like Jesus on a cross or um, Barack Obama <laughs> like sh hugging a, a little small child. Um, um, things that, that evoke an emotion are like huge no-nos. Um, you are not going to find any vices, so no alcohol, drugs, tobacco, pornography, or firearms. Um, and alcohol is like a huge one in home staging. Home mm -hmm. stagers love alcohol; they put it everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, I always say that you know, it kills me when you see the bottle of wine in next to the bathtub. Like, just <laughs> add the razor blades as well, because <laughs> the last time I drank wine in the bathtub, it was not romantic. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, you, you will find um, beautiful classic pieces that don't match. 
Um, I think matching is the lowest form of design. Um, I oh, think that coordinating is a much higher form of design. Um, I came up with that with my, my son when he was three years old. My son is black, I'm white. He came to me at three years old and he said, I wish we could trade skin. And I said, why do you want to trade skin? And he said, because all of the other kids at school match their parents. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I said that we don't we don't we don't match. What we do is we coordinate. Look how beautiful your skin is next to my skin. Uh -huh. I said matching is like the lowest form of design. We coordinate. And he was like, oh, we coordinate. And I was like, Whew. okay, we got through that one. <laughs> That's um, brilliant. <laughs> so. Um, our houses are going to coordinate. They look like somebody has lived there for 20 years, traveled the world, collected a huge supply of things, threw a bunch of stuff that didn't match together, and somehow made it look mm -hmm. effortless. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like when you walk into one of our houses, it's like watching Nadia Comaneci do a beam routine. Have you ever seen her 10 on mm -hmm. the beam? She doesn't break a sweat, and you watch the routine, and you're like, I could totally do that. You should walk into our houses, and it should feel like it took us 10 mm -hmm. minutes to set that bad boy up. If it looks hard, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna find a very, very easy looking space. That being said, like we iron our sheets because it looks horrible in photographs because they're so wrinkly. Um, so you're gonna find houses that are extremely organized, we rely heavily upon 90 degree angles. Um, we provide, we rely heavily on symmetry. Um, what else do we do? I think that's, does that about answer your question? Yeah, how about a little bit on the rhythm? Um, rhythm and repetition. So um, we um, utilize um, artwork for the rhythm and repetition a lot. And so we'll take the same frame with different series of what we call the series. And so like maybe we'll go and we'll buy a book that are all bicycle photographs and we'll mat all of those in, in the same frame over and over again. And we'll hang them in a repetitious series that are all spaced out evenly and all hung perfectly even. So you end up with this like um, grid or, or um, uh, rhythm uh, that takes you down a hallway or through a room um, will have um, you know dining room chairs that are of course all the same and it's over and over again the table is set and it's all the same over and over and over again um, our our space is almost borderline on boredom um, they're so simple and so clean that because they're trying so hard not to overshadow the house that they they almost they're almost boring yeah so I think that's where it comes from. Yes. Bathroom colors. I still remember you telling me bathroom. Bathroom colors. Okay, this is gross. If you're grossed out easily, plug your ears. Um, there are four colors we don't put in bathrooms. They are um, red, yellow, green, and brown. Poop, pee, blood, mold. Um, these are the four things you don't want in somebody else's bathroom. Um, as the father of an 11 year old child, yellow walls in a bathroom grosses me out because they don't have good aim. Um, <laughs> so. Um, we concentrate heavily on white in bathrooms. Um, it's the same principle as when you go into a hotel. Um, has anybody ever stayed at a hotel before? What color were their sheets? They were white. Would you ever stay at a hotel that had brown modeled sheets? I, ew. So when you're buying <laughs> somebody else's house, you really, you want it to be clean. And so in the bathroom is the most important. And so everything in the bathroom is white. The question is, do we stage differently for different demographics? And a lot of people ask it, do you stage differently for different houses? For different houses, no, but for different demographics, yes. So if we are staging um, in the core of the city and it's in like the fours, then we're looking at a family that's, you know, in the 20s to 30s, they're gonna be a little more hip, they're gonna be a little bit more, um, uh, um, uh, I will say hipster. Um, if we're staging out in Beaverton, it might be a whole lot more conservative. It also depends on like how good are the schools in this area. And sometimes, and that's, we ask uh, like three questions. How many bedrooms do you have? How many people live here? Oh, four questions. How much is this house gonna be sold for? And are the schools desirable in this area? Um, and sometimes they'll be like, hey, the elementary school has a horrible reputation, but the high school here is awesome. So we're gonna stage for a family that's slightly older because they're gonna have kids that are in their teens. So looking at 30s to 40s versus 20 to 30s, hmm. they have different aesthetics. And if we're staging in Palm Springs, where we're dealing specifically with retirement communities, we can't put vintage radios in retirement communities because they see a vintage radio as my mom's crap. Whereas somebody who's 20 or 30 is like, that's grandpa's cool radio. You wanna be like your grandparents, you don't wanna be anything like your parents. And so really age demographics, um, are, are gigantic, um, and depending on, on, on family makeup demographics are gigantic. So yes, it changes based on the demographic, and we're constantly making up a demographic of who we think that buyer is, and we're trying to make it as large as possible and attract as many people as we possibly can. Um, to sum it up, 
my favorite thing about what I'm doing is that I feel like I haven't gone to work in six years. Um, I feel like I completely cheated the system and I can't believe people pay me to do this. <laughs> How great. Yeah, I, I think that that's really the biggest part of it. I think that's been the biggest draw of it. The second thing that I think is fantastically awesome is that um, Spade and Archer has provided well-paying jobs with good benefits in design in Portland, Oregon, which doesn't exist. We pay our employees way too much and we do it because we feel that, that you shouldn't have to sacrifice comfort in order to be a designer. Um, you should be amply compensated for your work. And so being able to provide um, a healthy wage, a living wage for our design staff is gigantic to me. I feel, I, every night I go to bed and I feel like I, I'm okay, I'm doing all right because I'm providing for people that wouldn't have unless I did this. So it's, that part's hugely rewarding to me. My people are, are the most important part of this business. So. That's super, and I, I wonder if you could have a word with some of my writing clients about uh, the rates that they pay. Yeah, right, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm aggressively passive aggressive, so no. Sure, sure. Well, you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a true Portlander then. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll wrap up there, but thank you, thank you so much to everyone for coming, and uh, let's give a round of applause to our guests who are just